मैं अब जो है प्रोफेसर टी के उमेन साहब से दरखास्त करता हूं कि वो हमारा अपना कलीदी खुदबा पेश करें आई स्टैंड हियर विथ कंसिडरेबल अमाउंट ऑफ ट्रेपिडेशन बिकॉज पर्टिकुलरली आफ्टर द इंट्रोडक्शन वेन माई गुड फ्रेंड प्रोफेसर मदीन रिक्वेस्टेड मी एट ए वीक मोमेंट आई एग्री टू कम and when he again asked me to send the address i said i don't have any address actually i have not uh, written it in the real sense of the term but i will try to say something and since i have already written on this theme i don't like to repeat it and this is a conference on exclusionary perspectives for muslims and marginalized groups as the title goes and therefore i try to focus on muslims to the extent possible the articulated intention of the center for the study of social exclusion and inclusionary policy which has convened this conference is and i quote studying the muslims as a socially excluded group exclusion of urdu speaking population in addition to other excluded groups such as dalits and tribes unquote this is my first opportunity to visit this university which draws its inspiration from maulana azad an incurable secularist the sense in which we use the term in india since my task is merely to deliver the keynote address i shall rest content by posing a few issues our host should be grappling with in the course of its future agenda for contextualizing and problematizing social exclusion in indian society and evolving a policy of social exclu exclusion we must first of all specify the features of the entity of our common concern namely the indian society like all societies Indian society too is stratified based on gender age classes rural urban differences and special ecological distribution of population think of the adivasis viewed thus exclusion is a universal phenomenon in fact a normal phenomenon in the sense in which emily durkheim used the term for those who are not familiar with durkheim when he said something is normal it only meant that if a phenomenon is something which exists everywhere and it cannot exist with that phenomenon the phenomenon under consideration is normal if exclusion is present in all societies then it is normal but that which has believed to be normal may become non normal as societal values change for example it was believed for centuries that the difference between men and women is biological and genetic therefore there existed an acute division of labor based on gender which excluded women from many spheres of activity but today at least in theory the sex typing of occupations is a social phenomenon of the past and women have access in theory to all occupations if all societies are stratified most societies in the contemporary world are heterogeneous based on culture and race the more important aspects of culture which can contribute to exclusion are religion language and lifestyles race becomes a basis of exclusion because of phenotypical differences what is important here is not facticity because the genetic difference between a beast like man don't get offended and a pretty woman is very little indeed negligible genetically speaking but racism as a social phenomenon is rampant and an important source of exclusion all over the world it exists and racism becomes an acute problem in multiracial societies india is arguably the most culturally diverse society in the world our religious and linguistic diversity are mind boggling in fact there is not a single cultural phenomenon in india which exists in the singular
think of dress, dietary practices, music, architecture, or what have you. Diversity, thy name is India. With regard to phenotypical features, we are not that diverse, but India do have elements of Caucasoids, Mongoloids, and Negritos in its population. Consider the Kashmiri Pandits, the Saraswat Brahmins, the Nagas, and Mizos, the Vitish North Indian, and of course, the Dark South Indians. Yes, we do have peoples of diverse racial backgrounds. But diversity, be it cultural or racial, is not a problem. But coupled with inequality, it begets a host of problems. And our religious, linguistic, and racial groups are unequal. This leads to discrimination and hence exclusion. Thus, India, with its cultural and racial diversities, is bound to have a wide variety of exclusionary practices, the contents of which are vastly different. I have said all societies are stratified, and most contemporary societies are heterogeneous, and Indian society is both stratified and heterogeneous. But there is a feature which is specific to Indian society, namely hierarchy. The Vice Chancellor referred to that. There is a fundamental difference between stratified and hierarchical societies. In the former, at least by definition, equality is possible through mobility, both upward and downward. But in a hierarchical society, anchored to the caste system, inequality is not only institutionalized, but also sanctified. Therefore, the ritual rank one is assigned at birth persists in spite of the upward mobility. One may achieve in secular context. I have some very fascinating examples here, but I will not uh, spend any time on that. This is because of the bi-dimensional status system that exists in a hierarchical society. Thus, in India, the late Jagjivan Ram could not enter the temple at Puri when he was the defense minister of India. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar could not, have a, could not hire a Tonga when he was practicing law after obtaining the prestigious Bharat law from England. Thus, even when one gets included and this is very significant, in the secular status system, one may remain excluded in the ritual status system. Therefore, insofar as the caste system which sanctions and sanctifies inequality exists, an inclusive society will remain elusive. There is a fourth feature in, of Indian society which causes exclusion which exists between linguistic groups as exemplified by the sons of the soil phenomenon. But these excluded people are included somewhere else within India. Thus, the Tamils may be excluded in Mumbai or Biharis in Assam, but they are very much included in their respective homelands. But this is not true of religious minorities, particularly Muslims and Christians. They are political insiders, that is, they are citizens, but perceived as cultural outsiders, which is not based on facts. Thus, a section of the majority religious community define and perceive um, the, these minority religious groups as cultural outsiders. I refer to this as externalization. The point to be noted here is that when these four sets of factors, stratification, heterogeneity, hierarchy, and externalization operate in conjunction, they produce a phenomenon which I designate as cumulative exclusion, emanating out of cumulative deprivation, which the organizers of this conference invoke if you have read the write-up that you received, but do not acknowledge. Thank you for that. With this general introduction, let me now dilate upon the case of Muslims in India. If inclusion of a community is to take place, three actors should play their respective roles in unison. The state, the majority community, and the excluded minority community. Although 
constitutional promises and provisions are in place, it cannot be asserted that the state in India had done all that is possible to bring about social inclusion of Muslims. And this is widely known, acknowledged, and documented. The latest instance being the report of the Prime Minister's high-level committee, popularly referred to as the Sacher Committee report, submitted in 2006. That RSS and uh, the political party which draws inspiration from its ideology are virulent in their attacks on religious minorities is also a well-known fact and articulated frequently. So these two are known, therefore I will not deal with them. But what is almost missing in the discourse on social exclusion of Muslims is the role the Muslim community itself has to play. This needs to be urgently rectified, and I propose to focus on this dimension in the remainder of my address. But before that, let me refer to two unpardonable deficiencies in the measures taken by the state in India. When I refer to the state in India, I'm talking about the union, not particular states. That is provincial states. One is the issue of reservation, which is very hot which has become rather vibrant after the Justice Mishra Commission recommended reservation for religious minorities with a specified quota for Muslims. The religious minorities need to proceed with abundant caution before endorsing this measure. If it is accepted and, Im and implemented, it will lend credence to the fiction of minority appeasement, a myth the Sacher Committee had effectively exploded. You know today what are the facts. There was no minority appeasement in this country. The fact is that reservation based on religion cannot be given within the existing provisions of the Constitution. Of course, the Constitution has been amended nearly a hundred times, and it can be amended yet again for this purpose. But Given the present composition of parliament, this measure will not get the required support. Even if it does, and the relevant provisions are amended to extend the basis of reservation to include religious minorities, that provision will remain eternally contentious and a permanent source of tension in India's civil society in which the presence of the majority religious community is and will be decisive. So even if we assume that this happens, we will have to stay with that tension. If religion cannot be the basis of giving reservation, so is class or income. Again, the constitution can be amended. But that means all citizens of India, irrespective of their religious affiliation, below a certain level of income will become eligible. Once again, given the staggering numbers below the poverty line, this is not a practical proposition. It's here that the constitutional provision as it exists, providing protective discrimination to the socially and educationally backward segment of the population becomes rational and practical. The process was set in motion with the Presidential Order of 1950, which provided for certain entitlements to scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. As for the scheduled tribes, the entitlement holds irrespective of their religious identity. I hope this is known. Whether a scheduled tribe man is a Christian or a Muslim or whatever, he or she can get the entitlement. But in the case of scheduled caste, first it was given only to the Hindu SCs. In 1954, it was extended to six of uh, SC background, and in 1990, the Buddhist of SC background was also brought under presidential order. Please note, and this is very important, that the policy is applicable only to Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists of SC background, and to bring the Muslims and Christians of SC background under the purview of this policy is eminently just, and this does not call for any constitutional amendment. However, 
there are difficulties posed to this measure, both by Hindu militants and, unfortunately, Muslim conservatives. Hindu militants argue that Islam and Christianity do not endorse the caste system, and therefore, to extend reservation based on caste is against the tenets of these religions. In fact, if you have read, according to newspaper reports, the BJP conclave just concluded showed great concern for both Islam and Christianity because if caste-based reservation is given to them, they argue that it is against the pronouncements of Holy Quran and the Bible. I don't know whether you've read that. What a great consideration for you. You must rejoice. But <laughs> the problem is that while they are right, if you go by theological doctrines of these religions, which proclaims equality for all core religionists. But we need to note two points here. One, the issue here is not theological doctrine, but social praxis. And there is incontrovertible evidence that discrimination based on caste background exists in Islam and Christianity in the Indian subcontinent. When a religion is transplanted to a new locale, the social structure of that area is bound to influence the everyday life of the believers, although their belief system and ritual practices may not be affected. Two, the proclivity on the part of a section of Muslims, usually of upper caste descent, to deny the existence of caste discrimination among the Muslims in India. I remember soon after the Sacha report was released, about 22 or 24 uh, Muslim mullahs have signed a statement condemning the report, saying that the report is trying to divide Muslims of India. I don't know whether you have read it, but we have records for that. But the fact is, we know through researches, one of the earliest one was uh, Dr. Ansari of Lucknow University. But the one which is familiar to all of us is sitting there, Professor Imtiaz Ahmed, social stratification among Muslims. So, we all know, those days, the Ashraf Adilaf dichotomy was talked about very frequently. But now, it is increasingly known it is not simply a trichotomy, but uh, not simply a dichotomy, but a trichotomy. The broad social categories being the Ashrafs, the Ajilafs, and the Arzals among Muslims, roughly comparable to the upper caste, the OBCs, and the SCs among Hindus. This denial of division among Muslims is projected to emphasize what is called the internal unity among them, and those who refer to the internal differentiation among Muslims or researchers are accused of dividing Muslims. That this suits the legislators, the administrators, and even the judiciary. And uh, therefore, they oppose what is called caste-based reservation for Muslims. Now, available evidence, statistical evidence, reveals that Three to four percent of Muslims accept that they are of SE origin. I hope you know how the census operates. They ask you, what is your caste? Whatever that you say is recorded. But this could be a gross underestimation because of the prevailing ethos of denial regarding the existence of caste discrimination in the community and because of the social stigma associated with those of SE background. However, those who accept OBC background are about 40% among Muslims, 38, 40. And they are above the ritual pollution line. Those of OBC background, too, are eligible for certain provisions of affirmative action, including reservations in certain contexts. Which is to say, 
It is absolutely legitimate for Muslims to demand all those entitlements which are extended to Hindus of similar backgrounds. Hindus, absolutely legitimate for Muslims to demand all those entitlements which are extended to Hindus of similar backgrounds. Hindus, Sikhs or Buddhists. Such a demand is within the constitutional mandate and in conformity with the practice now followed by the state in the case of SCs and OBCs. This is the route that, in my view, that religious minorities should pursue to progress towards inclusion, which will not require the state to compromise on constitutional principles as it stands and will not attract virulent opposition from the majority community, I mean the conservative elements among the majority community. I have referred to two unpardonable policy deficiencies and discussed the reservation issue. The other relates to the grossly inadequate political representation of religious minorities, particularly Muslims, in the legislative bodies, state assemblies, uh, parliament. Once again, a reservation of constituencies based on a religion is constitutionally untenable, but it is provided for scheduled caste. Generally speaking, the social background of candidates are taken into account while selecting them by all political parties. Therefore, it is quite defensible <coughs> if constituencies with substantial SC population are reserved for them. But through a bureaucratic manipulation, a large number of constituencies in which the Muslims, please underline this, the Muslims have a higher proportion among the population as compared with SCs are declared as deserved constituencies. Now what does it mean? This means the possibility of Muslim candidates being put up as candidates for an open electoral contest is thwarted. In turn, this leads to the gross underrepresentation of Muslims in the legislative bodies. The point is illustrated with reference to Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and West Bengal in the Sachar report. If this administrative manipulation is done away with, there is a great possibility of Muslim political representation in state assemblies and the parliament. And this is a legitimate and plausible demand which the Muslims should press for. Because what is here intended is not to reserve a constituency for Muslims, but to say that wherever Muslims are in large numbers, in large proportion, those should not be reserved for SEs. Therefore, we will have an opportunity to contest. I have noted earlier that three agents should act in concert to effect inclusion of minorities, the state, the majority community, and those who are actually or feel excluded. The position of those who claim that they are representatives of the majority community is well known and does not call for any repetition. I've written about it several times on occasions. Therefore, let me discuss what the Muslims can and should do to accelerate the process of inclusion. Let it not be misunderstood. I'm not defending the state. I'm not on the side of the majority community. But we all know what the state has not done. We all know the position of the majority community. <coughs> and therefore, my focus in this institution, for a variety of reasons, is on the role of Muslims to get included. The fundamental dilemma here is the trade-off between what I call equality and identity. In the context of building nation states in West Europe, this was precisely the expectation. The religious and linguistic minorities were asked to surrender their identity to get equality from the state. But this is an untenable proposition in the 21st century India. Minorities legitimately insist on the preservation of their identity and demand equality of citizenship entitlements. But the context of these two demands 
preserving identity and insisting on equality need to be carefully delineated. And that is a crux of the problem. Identity in the context of our discussion relates to religious identity and equality to the secular context. But if the minority community conflates the two contexts, religious and secular, this will pose interminable hurdles in the progress towards inclusion. This is precisely the dilemma faced by the Muslim community. Let me list some of them, <coughs> although some of you may find it not very palatable. One, education. In the contemporary world, secular education is perhaps the most important instrument of equality through upward mobility, which is a great leveler between groups and communities and families and individuals within them. At the same time, religious education is perhaps the primary tool of reinforcing the identity of a religious community. But the two, secular education and theological education, perform radically different functions. And to mix the two often create problems. Two, generally speaking, and you know, I don't want to elaborate on this. You all know what I meant. Generally speaking, in uni-religious states, the state legal system, SLS, and the religious legal system, RLS, are integrated. But in a state with multi-religious population, this may not be always possible. And yet, the SLS need to be accepted is in as many contexts as possible. What I'm hinting at is cultural diversity will beget legal diversity. But to the extent the religious legal systems curbs individual freedom, the state legal system may intervene, which is to say, in a modern polity, the sphere of religious legal system is likely to shrink, and that of the state legal system may expand. This needs to be recognized by the religious minorities which demand inclusion. Three, just like there is multi-legal system to deliver justice, there are other contexts in which several routes to achieve the same end exist. For example, health care can be achieved through Ayurvedic, allopathic, homeopathic, or Yunani systems of medicine, which emerged and crystallized in different regions of the world <coughs> and may have got attached with different uh, religious communities. But to insist on the continuation of these linkages could be antithetical to evolving and inclusive society. Uh, I very frequently refer to myself as an incurable pluralist, and I say medical pluralism is a, possi is a possibility. If I have a heart attack, I will not go to the Ayurveda man, but if I have some itching on the body, I do. <clears throat> so it is a differential way of what kind of illness or disease involved and what kind of medical system is more feasible. Four, in the contemporary globalizing world, the institutions of market, particularly financial institutions, are of global spread. In such a context, to insist on nurturing financial institutions such as Islamic banking may decelerate the process of inclusion of Muslims in the financial context. I remember when I visited Hyderabad as a member of the Prime Minister's high-level committee, some young people arguing with us, why should we not recommend for Islamic banking in India? But there are difficulties. Five, the, and most importantly, to link language, which is secular in context, with religion may irretrievably and adversely affect the process of inclusion. I propose to deal th with this issue at some length because this has led to the exclusion of Muslims, also because this institution is centrally focusing on Urdu as a language. There's nothing bad about it, but we must understand the consequences. It, <clears throat> let it be noted at the very outset that the tendency to link religion and language is widespread, 
and exemplified by the examples of linking Sanskrit with Aryan Hinduism. There is no link between the two, actually. My maternal grandfather was a Sanskrit Pandit, I'm, and I'm not a Hindu, incidentally. Tamil with Dravidian uh, Hinduism, Punjabi written in Gurumukhi script with Sikhism, Pali with Buddhism, Hebrew with Judaism, and Arabic with Islam in the Middle East. However, if this linkage exists, when both the religious community and linguistic community are the same, and in a majority, within a polity, it may not really pose a problem. In fact, that would lead to a kind of hegemony. On the other hand, and that's the point, if both the religious community and the ling linguistic community are in minority, their exclusion will happen in all probability because of the language. It's not intended. This is an unintended consequence. Urdu suffers from several disabilities. The constitutional disability of Urdu is evident from Article 351 of the Indian Constitution. If you go back and read your constitution, you will find that that constitution privileges Sanskrit, primarily Sanskrit, that's the word, for the promotion of Hindi slash Hindustani. This smacks of a deep cultural prejudice against Urdu because it's a product of interaction between Persian and Hindi. If Hindustani <coughs> were to be developed as a language which represents what is called the composite culture in the constitution of India, the role of Persian cannot be ignored. But it is ignored. <coughs> in that place, Sanskrit is uh, put up front. The attributed association between Islam and Urdu in the context of the Indian uh, subcontinent was reinforced by its adoption as the official and national language of Pakistan, in spite of the fact that Bengali, Punjabi, Sindhi, Pushtu, and Baluchi are the major mother tongues spoken in Pakistan. You may ask why it is relevant here? Because they happen to be in our neighborhood. It has relevance. As is well known, this was one of the main reasons for the breakup of Pakistan into two wings. Similarly, in the Muslim majority, Jammu and Kashmir, Urdu is the official language, although it was the mother tongue of only 0.5% of the population in the state when this was done. These factors result in Urdu being subjected to what I call a political revenge in many parts of India. Precisely because Urdu is owned, possessed by Muslims, there is a political revenge. And this is particularly true in North India. However, to link Islam and Urdu is untenable because the mother tongue of the majority of Muslims in India is not Urdu. It is only in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar <coughs> that we come across Muslims whose mother tongue um, is Urdu. These two states, and I am referring to the situation before their bifurcation, account for only one third of the Muslim population and one half of the Urdu speakers of India. On the other hand, and that's very interesting, the majority of Urdu speakers are from states where the population of Muslims is rather low. This disjunction between Urdu and Islam rarely enters into the cognitive map of those who champion the cause of Urdu. But this results in the denial of the right to be educated in their mother tongue at the initial schooling, which is a constitutional mandate, not only to the Urdu-speaking Muslims, but also to the Urdu-speaking non-Muslims. Now, this is, I think, very, very significant. Thus, the Urdu speakers are subjected to a cultural disability. They can't even learn in their mother tongue. When I say Urdu speakers, both Muslims and non-Muslims. But this cultural disability is compounded by the political revenge I have referred to above because of the phenomenon of language shifting. 
those of you who are in the bad habit of looking at the Indian census data will come across some fascinating statistics. For example, between 1951 and 1961, bilingual Muslims who claimed Urdu as their mother tongue increased by 68.7%. A fourth disability, which may be designated as spatial disability. Among the scheduled languages of India, 12 of them may be considered as big. The smallest of these is Assamese, with about 20 million speakers, and the biggest being Hindi, with more than 400 million speakers. And Urdu is the sixth major language, with 56 million speakers in 2001. Among the big languages of India, only Urdu does not have a homeland of its own while those languages with their own distinct homelands and hence provincial states can and often do claim rights and privileges based on their linguistic identity, this possibility is rather dim in the case of Urdu speakers. If, for example, there were an Urdu speaking state or states in this country, things would have been quite different. This possibility is rather dim. Thus, Urdu is not the first language in any of the Indian states, save Jammu and Kashmir, where it is, uh, it is the, the primary language, not for linguistic, but for religious reasons. And in those states where it is the second language, Urdu is discriminated in numerous ways. Again, it is documented in the Sachar Committee report. To complicate matters, Urdu is the most spatially dispersed language in India. I've undertaken some exercises, I've published these things. More than Hindi, even as the size of those who claim Hindi as their mother tongue, which is often a very fictitious claim, I will not go into it now, is more than seven times as compared with Urdu. For every Urdu speaker, there are seven Hindi speakers. But Urdu is much more spread than Hindi as a language. This thin distribution of Urdu speakers into the vast space across India renders them a perennial linguistic minority in spite of its huge size, 56 million. The disabilities, constitutional, political, cultural, and spatial of Urdu conjoinly conjures up a situation of exclusion of its speakers, while the language policy of the union government, as well as the provincial states, certainly contributes to this predicament, the tendency to identify Urdu with Islam exacerbates it. And that's a tragedy. Friends, it is time that I give you the much deserved relief from the agony of listening to me. The singular point that I want to make is that inclusion of minorities will not come as a gift from the state or the majority community, but will be an outcome of constant struggle. But in this struggle, the exclusionary orientation of minority communities is also a formidable obstacle to overcome. I hope the director of the center and his team will try to focus on this in the years to come. Thank you very much.